yeah. I love my HBCU and bar. I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU and man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HCCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, keep tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir, and pay attention, because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Uh, BJ Jones, let me be up front. It's hard to do a show when you're supposed to be quiet as a mouse. <laughs> That's all right, Doc. <laughs> Welcome to episode 541 on Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBCU dash for all things HBCU sports, for institutions large and small from the NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBCU sports culture, HBCU athletic aesthetics, to facilitate the story of HBCU athletic programs in the business of HBCU sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Kabil. My co-host, Mike Washington Charles Bishop, are on the road. Look like Charles Bishop might have brought a little luck uh, over there uh, to the Colorado Buffs as he uh, traveled to uh, check out them for a weekend when he had an open one, if you would, uh, without any other assignments and couldn't get back in time to get this done. So we have none other than B.J. Jones. So we'll get a chance to really get in some inside football talk. Uh, B.J. Jones is feeling a little better this morning than the opposite way. But I imagine if he seemed like me, it was a lot of things left on the field on both sides in regards to that game that was played last night. I uh, had a chance to text a little bit with Joshua Sim Sr., although he can't be here. His chest is uh, very big, and he certainly is not quiet, unlike Dave, oh, man. <laughs> uh, who is certainly quiet as a church mouse, as he had other obligations. So a lot of people out. We might be able to get um, – AD to join us to give a little insight so we can mix it up some more. Uh, But today's episode of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. Well, I'm talking about those folks on the edge. Uh, Some of them are going to be more closer to the ledge. With that being said, Jackson State couldn't hold up their end of the bargain, and a lot of folks in Louisiana, from the other side, I'm feeling pretty good uh, this morning as opposed to way, maybe the way things started off. But with that being said, B.J. Jones, how are you doing this morning? Man, doing pretty good, Doc. A um, uh, lot of games yesterday. I, I think that there were a few programs yesterday uh, that kind of put everyone on notice. Uh, two in the CIAA in particular. Yeah, I think there's, there's programs in, in the CIAA that they put some programs on notice. And now you're going to have this question now, Doc. Is Grambling back? Yes. Is I think Grambling that's a fair back? question to ask in terms of what's stated. While many people may have thought they could win that matchup, most people came in thinking Jackson State. And even if they did win it, I don't think they thought they would dominate, at least in the second half, like they did. A lot of mistakes by Jackson State, which certainly leaves some question mark there for them in regards to where they thought they were moving. Big question marks over there in the Wildcat Nation for them uh, Mm -hmm. as there shouldn't be much question marks anymore from Clark Atlanta uh, Panthers and uh, Coach Teddy Keaton. If you don't think he should be high on your list, not that I want him to run from Clark Atlanta because that just doesn't seem fair for those Panthers, but it always seems to find its level then. And you talk about the CIAA, two top seven matchups, and we will unveil our top seven today. So we'll give you that new one from the major division. Mid-majors will be released on Tuesday, but uh, mid-majors had their share of top seven matchups. And you alluded to that two teams made statements. Um, And I've seen a couple of picks for maybe one of them. uh, But uh, in terms of the other, I don't think anybody quite saw that. And they happen to be at the top of the list. With that being said, let me go ahead and give you 
the top seven, and I'll do it from those receiving votes. So we'll look at 10 teams in terms of their scores at the mid-major level from this past week. Starting at Fort Valley State, the Wildcats, who were receiving votes, they lost to Delta State Statesman 27-24. to Close matchup. And Fort Valley has a, lost a couple of these close games. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of down the stretch. Um, certainly you can see their talent coming into the season. People thought they were going to be talented. Can they somehow turn that? Or is that just a note to come from the rest of the season that it just won't be uh, denied in terms of what they're getting done? Fayetteville State Broncos defeated, uh, which improved one and one. They defeated the number eight, if you would be, uh, Elizabeth City State Vikings, 31-7. to Both those teams are just outside of the top seven and played each other. Fayetteville State bounced back and got a big uh, win anytime you're in conference play to get it done. So fascinating to see how that went down there. At number seven, Florida Memorial Lions, after a win over Edward Waters, the state rivals in the SIC at the Division II level, they played Clark Atlanta, which was tied and called a tie, uh, 28-28. Uh, which we haven't seen since 1995 when obviously the OT rules were broken in. But this one was tied because of what? Weather and the distance associated with uh, Clark Atlanta having to get back on the road with the conditions of bus drivers and things of that nature. A little different when you don't have the charter flights, even though I've seen them cancel some charter flight games or call them early, whether it's baseball or football, and some uh, components just to make sure that they can – meet those required flight demands and things of that nature. Well, this was bust and Florida Memorial tie, but they bounced. this week they lose to Cumberland Phoenix 47 to 35. So they are one, one and one. It'll be fascinating all season. Check out that um, record as we always would include the tie at number six. You have the Shaw bears defeated Lincoln Lions. Big win 48 to 14. Shaw continues to uh, ball over what everybody thinks in terms of what they get done 21 i mean two and one and two and oh in conference race uh as they uh get it done this weekend and number five first one that you were alluding to is right here the virginia state trojans lost to number three winston salem state rams 15 and 14 one and two oh and one uh, a lot of people question the rankings there and they just kind of go week to week uh but we said that this was a chance for the rams to make a statement and they did after we finish this, I certainly want to get a little more of your thoughts in terms of the top seven. And I imagine particularly these matchups as we jump all the way to number four. And guess what? The Virginia Union Panthers lost to the number one uh, team, Johnson C. Smith, Golden Bulls, 21 to 16. They were number one two weeks in a row. A lot of people were not quite understanding it, thought they should be there at the time, but weren't sure that they would get it done in terms of what happened there. Well. Uh, Johnson C. Smith makes an emphatic statement, winning 21 to 16 over Virginia Union uh, at number four. And so they, Virginia Union Panthers, fall to one and two uh, and 0 and 1 in conference play. Told you about the Winston Salem straight at our three. They did defeat Virginia State uh, at number two. Clark Atlanta Panthers defeated, yeah, that's FCS uh, SWAC member Bethune Cookman Wildcats 38 to 57 on a 55 yard field goal as time expired. What a big win! They improved 3 0 and 1, uh, 2 and 0 in terms of what they've started off the season in conference race, including a win over Fort Valley State, uh, as well that we mentioned earlier. At number one, Johnson C. Smith Golden Bulls, as we told you, did defeat um, Virginia Union. They did that on uh, at home as the number one team that many people thought were probably the underdog, underdogs in that matchup, found a way to get it at, done at home, 21-16. to 16. BJ, take it away. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of the top seven, specifically some of those big games, that while the team may have been higher in rankings, people probably still see it as a mild upset? And particularly with uh, Winston-Salem State, um, in uh, Virginia State, a lot of people felt like Winston Salem State uh, played over their heads against North Carolina ANT, and that their ranking was kind of a a good job. Out of boy, you played over your head, but it's still early. We'll throw you a bone, and I think the Rams went out and they proved that they're right, they're worthy of their ranking. Um, if you look at the way that that ball game went on yesterday, Virginia State couldn't stop the run. 
Uh, Winston Salem was a, was able to run the ball down their throats and, and ran it at will. Um, so, and, and anytime you go on the road to Virginia State, a team that was you know predicted by many to take that next step in the conference, um, that that's a big deal. And another one was Johnson C. Smith. We saw Johnson C. Smith get off to the to quick start against Tuskegee um, in the Red Tails Classic um, to start the year. And I think people kind of felt like Johnson C. Smith would they would be better, but they wouldn't they wouldn't be a contender. Well, Johnson C. Smith is showing showing people. If you watch <laughs> what they did to Virginia Union yesterday, look at Jada. I always tell you, Jada Byers is one of the best running backs I've seen um, in, in college football. Look at his stat line yesterday. Yeah, Johnson C. Smith. Uh, I, I think them and Winston Salem State. Don't forget Shaw. Those three programs made statements on yesterday, and don't get me started with Clark Atlanta. I've been a, a Teddy Keaton fan since he's been at Steelman. Um, I remember that he can take he can take programs that don't have much, and he he infuses his energy, uh, his philosophy uh, into the programs. And next thing you know, they're rolling. Look what he did at Allen, restarting that program. Allen was a contender when he left. Um, which is something that's not easy to do. Um, Clark Atlanta, man, their best days are um, ahead of them. And then Fort Valley State, keep losing these close ones. Keep, keep losing these close ones. But something's telling me don't overlook the Wildcats when we start getting into October and November. I agree. Great points when you talk about it. And the same thing I said, something about Fort Valley says that they will be in the mix at the end uh, and they'll go on a run. Uh, but I'm fascinated to kind of keep your eye on and make sure uh, that they, uh, the coach can be able to keep them focused and get it done. Uh, but you alluded to it. I think the biggest storylines are uh, Johnson C. Smith and then Winston Salem State. Uh, to take uh, programs, win, win close games, which oftentimes if you're not quite getting over the hump, and you know this quite a bit, B.J. Jones, in terms of playing the game, there's a big gap uh, between a team, particular. Uh, as you're growing and you hadn't did it before until you take your next step and all of a sudden you find yourself winning these games. Talk a little bit about uh, your experience uh, of what that looks like when you start to understand that a team is going the transformation of being either bad to good or good to great. It's, it's one of those things where when you're building it, uh, even though you might be in the game with a contender, it's almost like you're waiting for the shoe to fall. And it can be one mistake and you can still be up. And when that mistake happens, it like it kills momentum. It kills confidence. You can can almost see um, the, the air sucked out of the room. And then you start getting to that point where you look the bully square in his face and you don't blink. Um, and then when you get to that point, you know that you're there, that. You know, when you look on that schedule and you see who's next, and it's one of those teams that have traditionally been at the top, it used to go, here we go. Now you're like, yes, I've been waiting on this. You're waiting, to, you, you you know, you're, bait, you're, you're biting you're at the bit to get your opportunity. And um, our coaches would always say, I know when we're there, when I don't have to do as much coach, co coaching, and you guys kind of self-police yourself. And I start seeing myself in you. Um, and when teams get there, uh, it's an amazing feeling. Um, and it's one of those things, man, when you get rolling, you want to keep rolling. You get mad when the bye week comes up because you you you, you want to keep it rolling. And I, and I think that's what we're seeing, uh, particularly with um, Winston-Salem State. Um, and and um, I think Winston-Salem State, I think they've hit that stride. And Johnson C. Smith – they don't even look like the same football team from two years ago, Doc. <laughs> no doubt about it. Great points. So let's get to the major division of what uh, took place, and then we'll take our first break. We'll come back on the other side, and we'll do our reveal. We have a couple of folks joining us, and they'll get their take along with B.J. Jones. Uh, this one is intriguing to me because uh, uh talked a little bit about this, and I put it out there that Prairie View since 2006 was 9-8, and eight, and I think that just stunned everybody. Um, and I also gave some insight, the reason why I say there's four errors in the football, if you would, between Southern and Prairie View. Yeah. The first error, which for most of us is before we even were thought in our daddy pants. Um, and you do respect for the elders uh, that seen that were back when Prairie View was running their championships. 
uh, under legendary coach Billy Nix. And that was up to uh, 49 in the 60s where Prairie View um, had a handle on this series, right? Uh, and then you get what I call two uh, independent periods. The first one uh, is a 16-game winning streak until 18, 1988, 87, if you would. Uh, and then Southern goes on another 15 winning streak. So you have a 32-game period where literally Southern um, not only won, but for the most part dominated in terms of the score. Uh, Prayer View, uh, 31 to 1 uh, during that period of time, all the way uh, to um, 2006, if you would, in the 90s. And in that period, the second one, you might be able to kind of give a gentleman's shake to Prayer View. They had no scholarship. But the first one, uh, there's nothing you can <laughs> put your hand on to try to figure out <laughs> <laughs> what type of silver bone that you want to give Prayer View. It just was bad. And this last one, but for the most people that lived through that era, they just don't see how Prairie View is doing this. And, a, and for them, it's an indictment of Southern, even though some ways Prairie View obviously has turned a page in the Prairie. Well, you get down to it, Southern does what the Southern does at Prairie View down there, uh, finds the way to win. Uh, couldn't escape from it. I have the shirt on, Caville family shirt on, because the only thing that I could like uh, somewhat be excited about that game, uh, if you would, is number four, Kobe Caville, my nephew. Got in the end zone first time over the last couple of years. He's had some big catches, including two that helped win the all-coin game when they were on the road last year that I put them in the position when they set up the game-winning kick that ultimately was enough to get Prairie to the championship game against FAMU. Well, he had a 72-yarder, B.J. Jones, for a touchdown and put him up 21-10. to 10. And I thought, okay, this might be the difference in the game because I knew Southern would make a run. Uh, but I thought that next drive that they scored so fast was really the difference in that game in terms of making sure Southern had some momentum. And credit to them. They kept pushing through and got it done. A lot was left on the bones, both teams in that game, uh, that uh, if you are a fan, obviously if you win, you're always happy that you get a win. But in terms of the way both teams played, you'd be like, uh, I don't know what this means for the rest of the season. That's me. We'll leave that to B.J. Jones maybe a little later as we get further into the discussion. But let me get back into the other scores. Morgan State Bears do what you're supposed to do to Virginia Lynchburg. All of a sudden, they found the offense. 56-7. to seven. South Carolina State Bulldogs did not play. Top seven, you had Texas Southern uh, Tigers lost to Lamar. Um, tough game there. Leading late. Went back and forth. Uh, but fall 20-17, to 17, which is, seems to be a refrain for uh, – HBCUs at the FCS level taking some tough losses. Shout out to Norfolk State. They got their win against Vivian Ma, which probably shocked a lot of folks because they dominated that game. The last score by VMI was literally with time left on the clock with a lot of other folks in the game doing mop up do it. The Howard Bison lost to uh, Hampton Pirates, according to Brian. He no longer called them Howard. They're Howard until they make it a rival in Hampton. Uh, took care of business, jumped out early. Howard did fight back but they ultimately lost 27 to 20. That was a top seven matchup. The Grand State Tigers that many of us featured as a top matchup to keep your eyes on, BJ alluded to this. They made a statement. They defeated uh, Jackson State in that matchup and beat up on them pretty good in terms of what was going there. 41 to 20, close at the half, but Gramlin pulls away and really shuts them down in the second half, getting two big scores uh, on the defense uh, to uh, really dominate Jackson State in a lot of ways. The Tennessee State Tigers lost to Tennessee State uh, Tech in that matchup. Looked like maybe uh, OVC, you could say that Tennessee State had turned the corner, was going to get uh, a big win on the road uh, as they were driving uh, just down 17 to 14. You say, all right, they get a field goal, take it over and I would score and close the door. Uh, interception return uh, for a touchdown. That pick six uh, sealed the deal for the Eagles if you were 24 to 14 over Tennessee State Tigers, and they are who we thought they were in terms of that matchup. Then you got Hampton Pirates, as you said, defeating Howard at the three spot. Number two, we told you that Jackson State lost to Gramlin, and FAMU uh, lost to the Trojans, played respectively in that game, particularly early, but they lose going down the stretch 34 to 7 to 12, I should say, in that matchup. Again, shout out uh, in terms of the first Defeat by HBCU Division II, defeating an FCS program with Clark Atlanta, getting it done on a 55-yard field goal against Bethune-Cookman 
uh, FCS, HBCUs, uh, were undefeated in those matchups. Um, and not, and many people kind of kept your eyes on this one. I'm not sure how many people believed it in regards to the defensive play of, of Clark Atlanta, but there were concerns about how Bethune Cookman could score. And they scored often and early in that matchup, but second half, boy, you're talking about things changing and on a dime. And that's what happened there. Uh, we're going to wait on your thoughts in terms of top seven. B. We're going to go to this first break, come back on the other side and do the reveal. Uh, with that, uh, we'll bring in our next two guests. Let's turn it back after this break and see what's next on the reveal. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Supermarket sushi, really? No. Wait, Troy, you work here? I'm never not working. Like head and shoulder scalp shield technology, up to 100% dandruff protection, even between washes. Never not working, huh? <laughs> oh, Troy, you're such a good teacher. Yeah, I know. <laughs> never not working. Never not working. Never ever not working. Are you serious? Never not working. Dandruff protection that's never not working. Head and shoulder scalp shield technology. Hey, grab me one, too. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot left and root about, root about. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Man, look who we have with us now. We have none other than Brandon King, sneakershop.talk.com, joining us for at least a segment. We have AD Drew also joining us at least a segment as we go through our major division reveal. With that being said, uh, shout out to Brandon King. He does the write-up for us for our top seven, and you'll see that release today right after we do it live here. We have A.D. Drew, the consummate that uh, gets it done for us as he uh, gets off the road for a weekend trip for himself. With that being said, uh, let's get to it without further ado. Uh, those receiving votes in the top seven, uh, as we look at those dropping out first, is Texas Southern Tigers lost a tough one to Lamar. Uh, in a lot of ways, those fans were going to be a little bit frustrated after that. Uh, I'm sure they believe that they had that game, were going to win it, could not hold on at the end. Tennessee State Tigers, uh, the two TSUs do the same thing, can't quite get it done on the road against one the conference mate in terms of Tennessee State, the Tennessee. Tech, uh, Golden Eagles there uh, are able to hold on and make enough plays to get it done, just like the Texas Southern Tigers do it in terms of Lamar Cardinals. With that being said, let's get in those three teams that are receiving votes just outside of the top seven. These three teams collectively making up the 10 programs this week, none other than South Carolina State Bulldogs. They did not play, so they remain at one and two uh, with 136 points just outside of the top seven. Morgan State Bears uh, got a solid win against Virginia Lynchburg at number uh, may improve to two and two, I should say, 134 points. And the Southern Jaguars go on the road and get a big conference win against Prairie Bay and m in overtime uh, coming from behind to get that done in classic fashion. Uh, they improved to two and two on the year and one and oh in the conference race with 133 points. Let's get to the top seven. Uh, this week in the top seven starts us off with Howard Bison, who are two and two on the season as they fall to Hampton. Uh, and they fall a spot from last week with 159, but they do find a way to stay in the top seven. At number six, Jackson State Tigers, they also 
uh, lose this weekend. They go on the road to Gremlin. They've had trouble there in the past, but they actually recently have done pretty good over there in the hole. But it looks like it may have reverted back to the old ways as they fall uh, in stunning fashion. And they uh, are at number six, dropping four spots in week number four. At number five, you have the Morgan State Bears. They jumped back into the poll rankings, started there in the preseason and remained there a week, but they fell out. But they jumped back in fine fashion as they improved to two and two, 178 points, bringing us to number four that were not ranked. You have North Carolina Central, the Eagles. Boy, you talking about making a statement uh, against their rival as they defeat uh, A&T 66 to 24. And uh, everybody, I'm not sure if it was that close, but they improved to two and two on the season. They earned, as they jump back in the poll, they earned one first place vote. Uh, as they are in at number four. I'm not sure if they'll drop back out. I'm fascinating to see what that looks like and how far they may climb. But when it gets into the conference race, you know, strange things are liable to happen. At number three, Florida a and Rattlers, uh, they fall from the one spot. They are two and two on the season. Uh, two first place votes, 194 points. Tough loss on the road uh, to a FBS foe. I remember when these teams used to have classic matchups in the Division II FCS playoffs, uh, but now Troy has moved on to the FBS in the Sun Belt. They get it done at home against the pesky Rattlers uh, that uh, bit them a couple of times but could not really uh, sink their teeth in with enough poison to get it done. At number two, Grandland State Tigers may have made the biggest statement of the week as they improved to the 3-1. and one. Uh, they have three first place votes and they jump all the way up from number five. That's three spots moved uh, as they're at number two. Uh, three first place votes again at 218 points. Number one, first time in a long time, first time this season, the Hampton Pirates, uh, three and one, uh, five first place votes, 220 points, have a big uh, win. Their lone loss is to another top seven program, which is Morgan State Bears. Fascinating to see what the Hampton Pirates have done, uh, getting some big victories, particularly after the loss to Morgan State to start things off at home. I think many people were concerned about the Pirates. They've righted the ship, defeated Virginia Union that everybody thought was uh, really big, and it all happened in the second half. It's like they've turned around their season, essentially starting with one half against Virginia Union, where they were down and looking like they were going to have one of the biggest uh, HBCU FCS Division two upsets of the year, not to be done. And they roar back, get wins over rival Norfolk State on the road. And then they take it to Washington, D.C. and get a victory against Howard. With that being said, uh, fascinating what that means. Let me go to our guest that just jumped on, B.J. Jones. I'm going to save you for last here. So, A.D. Drew, let me know what are your thoughts on the top seven in week number four? All right. Uh this was probably one of the toughest rankings that I have ever had to turn in for somebody. Uh, number one, you remember a couple of years ago when the BCSN computers had Hampton at the number one spot about this same time? Yes. And everybody laughed at the computer. Well, similar situation this year. Hampton, non-conference, has taken care of their business. What is Hampton going to do as they dive into their conference, conference play? That's number one. Looking at the top three, despite the records, the top three are essentially the same because all three of them have two FCS victories. So, which one do you which one do you rank higher? Grambling, who's defeated in Division Two, Hampton, who's defeated in Division Two, or Florida A and M? who's lost to 2FBS. So, like I say, this was a real tough ranking to do. I'm sorry, Dr. Cavill. I have to discount Morgan's win. It looks good on paper, but that wasn't nothing but a photo op defeating Virginia Lynchburg. <laughs> you got Virginia Lynchburg. If you got, uh, 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 what, what's the school in California that everybody's playing now? Lincoln. Lincoln, California. Lincoln, Lincoln in California. No, if you play them, you will not get any bump from me on my poll. I just let everybody know. Public service announcement. You will not get a bump when uh, AD Drew votes in any poll 
would you would you have those two on the game uh, on your uh, on your ledger? And then after that, Doctor Seville, it was like, what the heck, you know? Because everybody is everybody else is just ugly right now, man. This is probably one of the worst times to be vote since I have been voting because no one looks ugly. You go to the games late. And everybody's getting blown out by 30 and 40 points. But, you know, I'm supposed to pick out seven, let alone ten, with this with this type of stuff to uh, choose from? I'm going to leave that to y'all to figure out. <laughs> intriguing, <laughs> intriguing thoughts there. Uh, Brandon King, what are your thoughts in terms of the top seven in week number four? Um, I guess it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at uh, the back end of that, that top seven, when you look at, Howard, you know, you kind of have to wonder uh, what football team are they dealing with? Is it the, you know, the the team that, that barely got by Mercyhurst and, and beat up on uh, Morehouse, or is it is it the team that we've seen kind of taking on the chin at Rutgers? Um, so to me, it, it's kind of hard to, to judge kind of what exactly they are at this at this point. Um, so they they took a loss at Hampton with a, a critical turnover, you know, down there at the goal line as you're trying to go in and, and tie the ball game. And that ultimately uh, did him in. And then, you know, you look at Jackson State, and if you turn the football over that many times, whether it be high school, Pop Warner, college, it's just not a lot of teams that you're, you're going to beat turning the football over uh, at that frequency. And, and uh, Gremlin took advantage of it. Uh, and, and jumped on them. <laughs> Morgan State, I think this was more or less style points when you do play the, the VULs or the Lincolns. You know, you, you have to to kind of put on those 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 types of performances to make it even noteworthy uh, when, you, when you beat up on a team like that. Um, looking at what Central did. So the funny, when I first saw the score, I didn't think it was real. I thought somebody had photoshopped that when it popped up on my Twitter. I was like, there's no way that they house these dudes like this until I went back and watched the game. And, and like I said, it they probably could have could have hung 70 or 80 on them dudes. I mean, I that was that was impressive to the way that they they beat up on AT like that. Um, and then when, when you get into uh uh, A&M, just like uh, AD said, you know, they, they, they do have two losses, but um, it's to, you know, FBS schools. Um, so they, you know, you, 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 they stepped up in competition and uh, they did lose. They couldn't, they couldn't run the football worth a two. They had, I think, 55 rushing yards in the game. So they really became uh, one dimensional and they could not uh, get the ball into the end zone. So, you know, when you, you only score four field goals. Uh, it, it makes it look a lot worse than it is. Um, that that's something that they're they're going to have to address as you get into to swag play, uh, in terms of their inability to to not run the football. And and when you look at Grambling, um, the thing that that I saw uh, for them was the defense, and particularly over uh, the past three weeks, I think they forced what six turnovers a week before, another five uh, this week. So they're, they're getting it done on the defensive side. Um, and I think they're, in terms of, of play, they're uh, outshadowing the offense, even though they did give up about 400, 400 yards in the game. But again, if you're, if you're forcing that type of uh, turnovers, uh, then, then the yards almost become a moot point. And then uh, Hampton, I know they're number one. I'm still not completely sold on them. When they get into a CAA play, I want to see what they're going to be able to do against some of those those teams. Um, you know, they they've kind of ran through their their HBCU tour fairly successfully, so I think the the rubber is going to meet the road for the Pirates when we get into a conference play. So that's kind of my take on that. Great breakdown and analysis, a lot going on there. Let's get to B.J. Jones, get his thoughts on the top seven as he unveils uh, his rankings. He also will be a voter in the poll rankings, so we'll be able to move his data on to the rankings and be a part of shaping this as we move to be more inc inclusive. 
Uh, A.D. Drew talked about uh, being one of the current voters. Brandon King will be added to that. As I said, he does the write-up as we do the reveal. So you'll see this uh, become more expansive as we get more people involved of, that cover HBCUs to get their votes in uh, to make this even more rounded than it already is. With that being said, B.J. Jones is uh, week four, 2024, Doctor of his HBCU Major Division Football poll. What are your thoughts in week number four? Oh man, um, I would have had uh, Jack Jackson State. I had them a little bit higher. I know that that game last night was not impressive. Um, and the, the hole has been the house of horrors for <laughs> not only Jackson State, um, but all corner. Well, so yeah. Those two have really, I mean, it, honestly, it's been the house of horrors for everyone not named Alabama State. Um, right. if you look at it historically, um, right. so you know, I, I can kind of see they did rack up 400 yards, something. Uh, that, that that Brandon said they 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 did gain four hundred yards over four hundred yards total offense, uh, which if, if I'm a Grambling fan, I'm really excited about that. Now that's my defense coordinator mind coming in as defense coordinator. I'm looking at that four hundred yards because that six turnovers that's an anomaly. I'm real process oriented. We 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 gotta you know stop first downs and yardage first. Uh, but Jackson State shocked to see them at number six. Morgan State. Uh, me and AD Drew, we're on the same, uh, we're on the same wavelength there. You play Virginia uh, Lynchburg, you play um, Lincoln of California. That was a bye week to me. I don't even look at it. Um, <laughs> um, I think we should be embarrassed as, div as Division One institutions even playing those games, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, number four, North Carolina Central. Um, they look. Like we thought that they would look. Um, I think that that loss to Elon kind of made us kind of look a little sideways at them, but they dominated North Carolina AT. And if they wanted to score 100, they could have last night. AT had no else until, Nor until Trey Oliver started sitting guys down with names on the back of their jerseys. Uh, it, that was the only time that AT had a chance to do anything. Um, <laughs> Florida a and I will tell you this about Florida a and They played Troy relatively hard last night. Troy scored late, uh, threw in some late scores to make, make that score look a little bit better. Fam, right. you had some opportunities. And I don't have any pro – I, I think that Fam, you will be able to run the ball when we get in the conference. I don't, they're not going to see a, a defense like Troy uh, in the swag. I, I think that that's might might have been the best defense they're going to see all year. Uh, Troy's problem has been on the offensive side of the football. Defensively, they've been pretty stout. Um, this year, uh, Grambling State, uh, they find a way. It might not look the most aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it might look a little wonky, but they get it done, and that's all that matters at the end of the day. Uh, so it's gonna be interesting to see what they do uh, moving forward in, in in the season in Hampton. Congratulations on your number one ranking. We'll holler at you in about four weeks. And see in CAA play when, yeah, but you were number one right here. You, you have the fan, I need you to uh screenshot this, save it. Um, because I think the season's <laughs> gonna get, get a little rough for you. Um, as we get ready to get in CAA play, and, and to the credit, we have the Wednesday show where we bring on a couple of uh Hampton, and we it's basically independent programs with Dave, uh, and two gentlemen uh, that do a podcast for Hampton. Uh, in regards to what they're doing. And I think for them, they're going to be excited about this 3-1. Not necessarily number one ranking, because they 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 see it as what it is, just like you said, B.J. Jones. Uh, because I think coming in with the new coach that came in late, uh, they were concerned that they may be 0-4 or certainly 1-3. Yeah. Uh, but it'll be fascinating when they get in that. But then they got that matchup against a t on the road for homecoming. So they got one more statement they can make at least. Uh, in terms of HBCU program play. Sticking with you, BJ, who won the week? Who had the biggest victory this weekend for you uh, out of this top seven? Oh, Grambling State. I think Grambling State, hey, I think they answered a lot of questions. People, if you look at Grambling State's schedule and who they beat, it's not that impressive before you get to Jackson State. All mm -hmm. right. They have the win over Tuskegee. Tuskegee is winless. They lost to Savannah State at home yesterday. 
they skated by Texas A and M Commerce, who was winless. They're, they're, this is not the Texas A and M Commerce of years ago when they were hoisting up the Division Two National Championship trophy. Uh, Cody Carthel has left, and he's gone uh, to Stephen F. Austin. Uh, that program had, has had um, a bit of change. Um, so be, Grambling beating Texas A&M Commerce was something that they were supposed to do. Uh, to be honest with you, they should have beat Texas A&M Commerce by more than what they, they beat them. But when you look at that score, a lot of people start looking at, you know, start looking at those wins. Tuskegee, Texas A&M Commerce. Um, it, it, people start looking at Grambling sideways. But I tell you what, the G-Man made a statement last night. To me, they were the more physical football team. Uh, they were disciplined, um, and they took advantage of every opportunity that Jackson State uh, gave them. And it's like Jackson State just kept giving them opportunities. Um, so shout out to uh, Coach Mickey Joseph and, and, and that staff. And, I, and I'll tell you what, you can say whatever you want to say about uh, Eric, Eric Dooley and, and his time. Um, at Southern University and what his offenses um, looked like. He, as an offensive coordinator at Grambling, looks like a completely different Eric Dooley. He looks re-energized on the sideline, um, and he looks happy again, like he has that stress off of him. Um, so, man, just shout out to uh, uh, Coach Dooley, uh, uh, Coach Mickey Joseph, and, and also uh, don't forget that Coach Rollins, who was the interim, Head coach at Southern University in 2021. It's a defense coordinator over at Grambling. Good stuff. AD Drew, uh, best win in week number four in the top seven? I have to go with Central. The fact, coming off of the two losses that Central had, you know, people were starting to question who was North Carolina Central. But for you to face your rival and obliterate your rival, like you did, and like BJ said, you know, that could, that score could have been a hell of a lot worse. You have to give it to Central for re-energizing their fan base uh, with, unfortunately, another, what, two, three weeks before you get into conference play? Oh, wait a minute. Central has Norfolk next week. So, great victory for Central to get confidence as they actually opened up be at play early next week in the Circle City Classic. Oh, good point. And you allude to what becomes a fascinating game with Norfolk State getting a victory against VMI, so they'll feel a little better. Brandon, who won the week? Top well, seven. <laughs> BJ and, and Mr. Edry took mine, so I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction. Um, and I'm going to say Hampton, and here is, is why. And, and these points have been touched on. Uh, previously, like I said, with the, the turmoil that was going on with that program heading into the season, and like you touched on, they could have easily been 0-4 or 1-3, uh, but to get through this stretch heading into conference play at 3-1 and one, um, with a win over over Howard, you know, the, the, the fan base, I'm sure, is feeling good about themselves uh, heading into conference play because there's a chance – they may not feel so good once conference play gets rolling. Um, so for them to kind of get through this stretch and at least have something to feel good about themselves heading into the tougher portion of their schedule, um, I think winning um, the, the the I didn't even know, the Truth and Service Classic, I'll, I'll call it by its regular <laughs> name, but, uh, you know, kind of gives them a, a, a little bit of a boost heading into uh, conference play. So. I'm going I actually am I'm going to say Hampton cuz there's a chance they probably I don't know if there's three wins on their schedule the rest of the way. Ooh, tough one. I like the breakdown by the guys. We'll take our next break, come back on the other side and talk a little bit more about these key matchups some of these guys uh will jump off as um, they uh celebrated the reveal of the top 25 and provided some great comments. With that being said, we'll be right back after this break. <laughs> At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. 
Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonia sent you. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thins reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot yeah. and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Will with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We're back with BJ Jones and AD Drew. Last segment, we revealed the top seven, and you told me who won the week. Uh, let's get into some of the key matchups that you saw outside of the top seven uh, or some teams that maybe took some tough losses in that top seven. Uh, what were some of the big games? And you can bring in some mid-major uh, games as well, if you would, this week. Uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, B.J. Jones, uh, outside of that top seven, uh, what were some other games that intrigued you uh, in terms of this past week? And tell me why um, that fits that bill. Um, outside of the top seven, I, I really wanted to look at Norfolk State and see could they salvage the season or would you see the losses continue? And I felt like VMI was a perfect opportunity for them. Um, and they did what they needed to do. They went on the road and they won big. Um, and I also wanted to see Alabama A and M. Mm. Um, Alabama A and M. Uh, we 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 knew what their schedule, how it set up. They they got the confidence win against Kentucky State. They eked by um, Georgetown, uh, Georgetown College in the IA out of Kentucky. And I wanted to see what they look like against an, an Austin P. And we talk about uh, Connell Mayne potentially being on the hot seat and what that looks like. And a lot of people uh, from 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 Alabama and them kind of felt like this is going to be the start, the beginning of the end of Connell Mayne. when you look at the way that that schedule sets up. So I wanted to see could Alabama and them get up. You had to get off to a fast start. Not really. Could they beat Austin P? But could they be competitive like they were a year ago? Um, mm -hmm. Well, that game was, was fairly close a year ago. And that game was over with really before it started. I'm talking about first quarter, man. It it was and Alabama and them, they they looked bad, Doc. It it they couldn't run the ball. They couldn't they couldn't throw the ball until late. They, they couldn't tackle. They looked bad. Um and I, I, they got FAMU coming up next week. And they gotta go to Tallahassee. Good luck with that. And I think right after that, they got I want to say they got Jackson State. Good luck mm. with that. Like it, it's the way that this schedule sets up. You literally have FAMU, Jackson State, um, Bethune Cookman, Alabama State is in there. Like you got some powerhouse programs coming, and to to start it off like this, man, this this we 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 might be on on main watch, Doc. I understand, um, and it's gonna get tough like that. 
another one I'm going to stick with you. I want uh, your thoughts on the Southern Prairie game uh, in terms of those coaches. I thought those two coaches came in um, really uh, with their season on the line in a lot of ways. And I know that seems tough to say week four, uh, particularly for Southern, their first conference games. You got so much ahead of you. Uh, but in terms of confidence, um, and maybe this is just one of these years where it ended up being week to week, literally, uh, where you think a team is playing at a certain level and they came in and you get another team that is not an opposite happens of what you think. Maybe this is one of those years. I've kind of said it at the beginning, but still, uh, this was tough. You you look at Prairie View, uh, Coach Bubba McDowell, uh, my understanding that is just a three-year contract, and much like you saw with Texas Southern, even though you've seen some growth, they've had uh, some expectations where, uh, to his credit, they made it to the championship game last year. was one game away two years ago. But sometimes you just get the odd unfortunes, if you would, that contracts, new ADs come in place. And it's two home games. Uh, people have talked about Prairie View fans, but they've actually showed up for these last two home games, and you had – Attendance with the fans uh, home for Prairie View against Texas Southern Southern. I think some of that was by the expectation this year. Tailgate area was full of uh, Prairie View more than Southern. And this is not to say that Southern didn't do what they did because they came uh, in their own shape and represented well. But Prairie View, in my mind, finally stepped up. Let's let's put it that way. That they finally understood the the mission and the invitation and ticket to the party that they can have fun beyond just homecoming about celebrating football season, their team. And they did that. <laughs> but you come out with two losses, tough games to watch. Uh, in terms of that, uh, I think, and I don't say this much about coaches, but a little some concern uh, if you're at Prairie View in terms of what this may mean. Obviously, they can get on the hill. They got another chance to make a statement coming up this week against Gramlin in the State Fair Classic. But uh, things are looking, turning in the wrong direction quickly if you're at Prairie View down there on the hill. Yeah, Doc, and and this is the thing about Prairie, about Prairie View, we're it's today is September the twenty second. You're already zero and two in the conference. Woo. You're so basically you're in a three game hole before we even make it to October. Tiebreakers, yep. And look who's knocking on the door next for next week. It's Grambling. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier. And uh, Bubba McDowell, I liked the position that he had Prairie View in a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like this could have been a statement year for 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 Bubba McDowell, um, but it's not turning out to to be that way. I think the one of the things that I, I didn't expect from Prairie View was the incons inconsistencies on offense, yeah. and a lot of that is because of the injuries that you guys have had at the quarterback position. Um, yeah, very true. So you know, there there's you know been you know that's to be expected, um, but. I didn't expect Prairie View to be in this position. I thought that Prairie View would 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 compete for the West um, this season. A lot of people felt like Prairie View would win the West um, um, this season. Um, and Southern, this was key because Southern loses to Jackson State, and anytime you lose to Jackson State in the manner in which you lost to them, a lot of Southern people are turned off, right? And I mm -hmm. felt like this was an opportunity. If you look at that crowd at Jackson, Southern didn't did, did not travel to Jackson in the right. manner in which right. they Absolutely. usually travel to Jackson. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. so there's a there's a percentage of the fan base that Terrence Graves has already lost. Now, none of this has anything to do with Terrence Graves. This right. probably is t this is tied to Roman Banks. All okay. right, this tied to Roman Banks it has nothing to do with Terrence Graves. Terrence Graves came into the season having to win over. A fan base that was already already skeptical, and when you lose to McNeese, who at that point had not won a ball game in two years, and then you lose to Jackson State in the manner in which you lose them, this preview game it was it was necessary that you win it because you're going to lose another percentage of the fan base, and once once you lost that one, you ain't getting you them back. It. You, you, you're you're it. not getting them back. So this I think Southern. this was right. This is, yeah, this is Southern. And that first half, my phone was blowing up because <laughs> there were people that had the email drafts. Oh, I, 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 I ain't got to tell you what I think. I seen the email drafts. They were ready to go to the president. 
Like they were that, that we need furniture moving immediately. And I don't know what Terrence Graves did at, in, in, at the second half. I don't know what that staff did in the second half, but big ups to Terrence Graves and that entire staff. Um, and I also want to get a, give a shout out to Damon Nivens. Damon Nivens catches hell because of the offensive line play at Southern. All right. Mm-hmm. It, it, it his offensive line play has has been less is it's left a lot to be desired over the last two years, but in that second half he made some changes up front. That offensive line looked night and day better. Southern came out in the second half, played with a different intensity. You can see it, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they got it done. So shout out to Terrence Graves and that entire staff. And I always tell people, man. If you're going to criticize that staff when they do things bad, you got to give them praise in times like this because they came out and Southern was a different football team in the second half and got it done. And hopefully Terrence Graves was able to win some of those fans back. Um, got a bye week next week, so you got to worry about losing them next week. But then next week you have Nichols, um, which is mm, – uh, but right. hey, get them, hey, get them prepared, ready to go. Then we said we talk about when you play the challenger, get those kids ready to meet the bully and meet, and, and and get the uh, look the bully square in the face. So, well, we'll see how this plays out for Southern and Prairie View as we get along uh, a little deeper in the season. Well, I love those comments, some great points, and I think the way that you find a way to win that game, coming back uh, after being down uh, like you were, and you keep pushing back because the team, let's be frank, they could have easily just quit. They kept playing. Right. And they found a way, um, much to their tribute. Some of the things that Prairie didn't get done, but at the end of the day, when you come back and win, take it to overtime, and you have a team in overtime on your four on your one, gets down mm-hmm. to your one, and you make four consecutive big plays to keep them out of the end zone to win it. Uh, a nice statement, credit to Southern in terms of holding on to that rope in a lot of ways, not letting it go. Eddie Drew, I know oftentimes you'll go uh, pivot for us and look D two. Uh, where are you in terms of uh, these matchups that were outside of the top seven? Where are you going? Well, I want to go back to that Southern Prairie View game because I was watching that game on the tarmac as I was uh, flying out last night. And I have to question Prairie View's clock management during their last drive, Mm. especially getting down in the field goal range where they could have done a little bit better and got that field goal attempt even closer so that maybe that game doesn't even go to overtime. I'll leave that one right, I'll leave that one right there. Uh, and overall, especially in the mid-majors, this has to be the point of the season where we go WTF when we look at some of these things. Excuse my uh, GPS going off, everybody. But uh, who would have... When you look at uh, what is where we at right now, who would have thought that there's a potential that Morehouse could have more wins than Tuskegee <laughs> going into the Tuskegee Morehouse class? Good That's one. Number one. Not That's me. Number, one. number two, we all talked about the CIAA with the new format, with the possibility of two northern teams. Uh, facing each other, especially the potential of teams facing each other back-to-back, i.e. Virginia State and Virginia Union. Nowhere in that conversation did we ever say Johnson C. Smith, Fayetteville, and Winston-Salem were going to be the class yeah, of the yeah. today and that we may have two Southern teams facing each other in in the championship. Uh, Good call. Three. We all we we all knew that it was going to take an offensive explosion to beat Clark Atlanta, even though Bethune Cookman is an FCS opponent. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell y'all the truth. It was in the fourth quarter. I was watching it, and then I got I got turned away because I had some other duties to take care of. And Bethune Cookman was up by two scores with about three four minutes to go. And when I got back on my uh, on our chat group. And everybody was talking about Clark Atlanta won that game on the last take of field goal. I was like, WTF. You know, I, what did I miss? I still have to go back and rewatch that game to understand what I missed because I have not had the opportunity to catch up. To so, see those last three minutes. Uh, trust yeah. me, you, you want to make sure you go back and see that. You're exactly right. 
Yeah, so that that's what we have right now. Everything is so topsy turvy, upside down. Who expected Fort Valley to be where to be where Fort Valley is sitting at right now? So that that's just so much going on. And then last my last point, when we look at our FCS HBCU, when we really analyze the wins that they have, you take a team like Alabama A and M. Alabama A and M is two and two, or whatever they are, but their wins are against a D two and an NAI. And we could we could take a deep dive into all of our FCSs and find flaws with ninety percent of their records right now, despite the fact that a lot of them sit inside your top seven, Dr. Field. I agree with that, and I think at the uh, FCS level, there are going to be a lot of coaches that are going to really kick themselves this year. This is a year where you could win you a conference championship and potentially a national championship and not have one of those perennial, legendary, great teams. Obviously, you win a championship. You have uh, a really good, if not great, team. But this year, uh, I think you can win it without necessarily having a legendary-type program, particularly what we've seen over the last three years. With that, we'll take a last break, come back on the other side, We'll talk about some key matchups that BJ Jones and AG Drew are looking for, and then we'll call it a show uh, in terms of week number five. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this last break. Hey, grab me one, too. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCS Team Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. At Auto Masters LLC, our mission is to serve our community by providing quality automobiles at affordable prices. All of our vehicles are inspected and certified to offer you the confidence in knowing you have a quality vehicle. Our goal is to provide you with a seamless process and positive experience for your automobile purchase. Financing recommendations and specific vehicle inquiries are available at your request. You can find us at www.automasters06.com and like, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, please feel free to contact Terrence Miles at 601-927-7794. And oh yeah, tell him Sonya sent you. Can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with BJ Jones and AD Drew. I'm really intrigued about week five, some key matchups, um, and I have some in mind, but I want to see where you all going to go. I'm going to start with you, AD Drew. Uh, what are some of the key uh, games in week number five that uh, uh, have your interest this week? Dr. Kabir, I'm going to have to rely on you since I am uh, traveling right now. If you can give me a list of the games and then I can talk about it because I don't, I don't have the ability to pull up the uh, the schedule in front of me right now. No, certainly understand that, and I appreciate you um, getting on the call and work with us. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll pick a couple of key and see which one grabs your interest that I have. I, I like the fact that you talked about Morehouse, Maroon Tigers, and Tennessee, uh, Tuskegee. Uh, with Morehouse having potentially more wins before that matchup. But we'll leave those off the table for now. Uh, you have Shaw Bears at Virginia Union Panthers. Uh, you have Bowie State, Winston-Salem State. Uh, and also in the CIAA, you have a Fayetteville State Broncos-Virginia State matchup uh, from a D2 perspective. 
Uh, I think those are some of the games that come in mind. You also have the Fort Valley State and Savannah State matchup. Of all those, any of them stick out to you in terms of key matchups and why? CIAA, Dr. Gaville. <laughs> yeah, that's where it lies right now, baby. <laughs> CIAA for life in football. How about that? Yeah. For the last decade or so, uh, so, the North has pretty much dominated the CIAA uh, narrative. And yes. when I say the North, how we traditionally had them when they were divided into two divisions, North and South. Week one, the South dominated. Was that a blip on the radar? Or is this a paradigm shift that we're seeing where the South regained uh, dominance of the CIAA? A lot going back to the days when Winston Salem dominated the CIAA. And I mentioned uh, three teams earlier in the CIAA. Excuse me, I failed to mention Shaw also as a team from the South that has entered the conversation of CIAA teams that we need to watch for with the potential of uh, becoming a uh, a champion out of the CIAA. Uh, and uh, who does Clark Atlanta have this week, Dr. Bill? Clark Atlanta is uh, open this week, I believe. All right. So they, uh, they, they they get a chance to sit back and watch the rest of the SIAC try to play catch-up with them because right oh, I take now, that back. I take that back. Clark Atlanta plays Lane Dragons, and they are on the road in, in Jackson. Hey. Hey, Coach uh, Byron Brown o- over there at Lane. You know, yeah. Don't don't sleep on Lane being able to get up with uh, with Clark Atlanta because the one thing I Lane agree. can do is run the football. And if you're going to beat this Clark Atlanta team, the one thing you must do is keep. Would, would, would y'all agree with me now that David Wright is the best quarterback in HBCU football? Yeah. yeah, you yeah. can certainly make that argument. Yes, yeah. Keep them on the sidelines. You got to pat. You got to pat my homes. Keep them on the sidelines, y'all. Yeah, yeah. I like the strategy. With that being said, BJ Jones, let's go to the uh, FCS side of things, and we'll come back to Drew and see if he has any final closing thoughts. FCS uh, side for you, uh, BJ Jones. What has your interest this week, and why? In the SWAC, is Jackson State going out to Houston to visit Texas Southern? Um, mm-hmm. I think Texas Southern is one of those things that people have forgotten about. Uh, right. Texas Southern um, could have been Lamar last night. Yes. It was a close ball game. It was one of those could have, would have, should have. They had, had State, the lead until late into the fourth quarter had, uh, where Lamar uh, traveled down the field and got a touchdown to take the lead and still yeah. uh, had a chance uh, with a minute something left and couldn't get a final drive. So you're absolutely right. Uh, more yep. than just the score, uh, Texas Southern was right there in that matchup. Right there. So I think Jackson State going to Texas Southern, this one's going to be a little bit interesting. Um, I think, of course, uh, Prairie View and Grambling uh, up in Dallas, State Fair Classic. Um, I, I think that that one's – Prairie View loses. This one is over. <laughs> right. Before we get to October, it's over. <laughs> Grambling, um, Grambling could put everyone on notice. That this is Grambling's division to win. Um, so I, I think that that's a key one there. And then in the East, Alabama State visits Bethune Cookman. I know Bethune Cookman just lost to Clark Atlanta. I understand. But they host Alabama State on the road. Alabama mm-hmm. State week was down to the fourth string quarterback. Right. I'll beat Sanford. Now, defensively, Alabama State is stout. Offensively, eh. If Bethune Cookman can manufacture some points, that's a mm-hmm. dangerous game for Alabama State. Um, and then, of course, the 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 swack opener for Florida A and M and Alabama A and M down in Tallahassee. Um, I think this is very important. If it ain't important for Alabama A and M, it's very important for one Connell man. Uh, and over in the MEAC, um, North Carolina Central and Norfolk State. For everything that, that Norfolk State, I mean, for, for North Carolina Central has done, remember in the MEAC, they don't have that many um, conference games. So one loss is, like, detrimental. 
<laughs> all the good, all that. The, my brother Josh feels great. They slip against Norfolk State, who Ooh. showed you against FAMU that they are capable. They're capable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think we're going to be looking at that one. So that to me, that's the big one. And also, man, I would not sleep on North Carolina, uh, North Carolina ANC going to South Carolina State. Uh, North Carolina ANC, the how the mighty has fallen. We're talking about uh, a program that was the premier program in HBCU football for about a five year stretch, five six year stretch. Right. How the mighty has fallen. And you talk about Chinnis Berry. What he's been able to do at South Carolina State uh, early on, I think you you get you know ANT going to South Carolina State. I think that's another interesting matchup that people want to circle and keep your eyes on. I'm gonna stay with those independent programs and then go to AD Drew to give a closing uh, statement monologue that he wanted to share with us uh, in terms of uh, some important components. I like where you went in terms of independent programs. I'm gonna stick with that. You're right that ANT. Uh, South Carolina State previous foes in the MEAC uh, talk about where A&T was and where they are now and where it looks like South Carolina State is ascending to. Uh, having that game uh, is going to be an important one. Two other ones on the independent radar that are fascinating to be Hampton Pirates, obviously number one rankings. Uh, they step outside of the HBCU fear and into conference play, which means now they're playing historically white colleges in the uh, colonial uh, formerly known as the Colony, now the CAA uh, Coastal Athletic Association. They play William and Mary, uh, another state rival, if you would, uh, particularly now it's a conference game. They have a chance to make a major statement in multiple ways in terms of this game. On the road, will it be or will they do what we saw uh, last year in a lot of ways where uh, they could do what they needed to do to get some big wins against HBCUs? Uh, but then when it came to conference play, uh, they just couldn't find a way to get it done. The other one I'll look at is Tennessee State. This is a program also where a coach is supposed to take that next step, um, the 0 and 1 in terms of that OVC, Big South partnership. Now they play the Big South part of that conference uh, merger, if you would. They play Charleston Southern uh, Buccaneers. This is a need win in conference play. You cannot go down 0 and 2. We talked about Prairie View in the conference. With them going down 0-3 uh, uh, and 0-2 being something that's uh, concerning, I think you have to say the same thing with Tennessee State. Uh, this is a matchup where they have to do it. They're at home uh, for this one as well. So I have one eye trying to see if Tennessee State can at least hold water uh, and maybe uh, take another step in the OVC. But if they fall 0-2, B.J. Jones and A.D. Drew, I'm not sure about what that looks like. So intriguing what that looks like uh, i like the way you talked about this conference matchups me at swack i think you ride on the money uh, as well as ciaa and siec good stuff but that being said ad Drew, go ahead and make your final statement and we'll call it a show all right i actually i've got a question and then i've got a comment i want to make my question is thursday night the dukes siac matchup Y'all have to give me your guys' opinion on the on what we saw in that in that uh, particular matchup, Ever Waters versus Benedict. First of all, I was excited on ESPN two. I was uh, in Atlanta uh, doing the uh, SWAC basketball media days. Uh, Thursday was the women, and Friday were the men. I thought first, let me say kudos to the SWAC, turn the media day and the coaches and the players. Job well done. Uh, really taking the next step for basketball and make sure it gets some of the uh, praise and lower it should as continuing to push uh, D1 basketball on that side. Uh, but I came back to my hotel room, got a chance to saw that, was excited that the game was on. Uh, but I noticed and I kind of peeked out early before I was doing some stuff and the game started at 8. So I got a little lather and got in there. I got back to the room. It was getting late, uh, 1030 to get prepping for Friday. And I was like, this game is taking so long. And I started looking at the penalties. And then it continued as I closed out the game. It was so many penalties that it was hard to watch. Now, I understand referees, obviously, penalties are penalties. You got to call it. But you've always heard folks say at any level that you basically call holding on every play if you needed to, which means as these uh, referees are calling these games, they have to understand that they need to improve too. 
So I don't know if the SIC is in the member presidents are going to have to double down to make sure they can get maybe a better quality of referees. I hate to say those for them young, because uh, these men that are out here, I know they're trying their best, but they have to understand as the SEC, SIEC is taking the next step and getting more exposure. It, you have to know what that means of calling the game on the television. That was just tough to watch in regards to the number of penalties, the time they're penalty. And that is not even getting to the close of the game, uh, which when the referees essentially lost control and could not find out what they were going to call or what the rules were, conversating with both coaches, with both of them being upset, and then it leading to the fact that uh, kudos to Benedict for making the plays at the end of the game to get the win. But there was a lot of question marks uh, that made it tough to watch that game uh, in that. And so, obviously, this high school commission, Dr. Holloman, I must admit, is a friend of mine. Um, and so I wish him the best. But I was like, oh, man, we got to find a way to make it better. But uh, HBC Atlantic, what do you think for the SIC? Because they have a lot of momentum, so many things positive going on. And to get a outcome like that on television, just hard to watch. It ended up being four hours, four hours plus. Yeah. BJ? Exactly, uh, think- BJ, but I want to add, BJ, is it time for the SIAC to consider adding replay? Add yes. Yes. Um, I, I saw that uh, during the Miles and Lane game yesterday. Um, uh, There was a play that would have been overturned. Mm-hmm. Uh, due to um, if, if, if they would have had uh, replay, uh, and 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 number one, the game started so late. Um, I was actually into the NFL game, and then uh, on the chat it was like, "Hey, you know, we got a HBCU game now." I was like, okay, "Let me turn over." Um, Edward Waters. Um, they are you called you called this last year, uh, AD, and they're still the same. They're uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde. You you don't know what you're gonna get with with Edward Waters. They can play with anybody. They can lose to anybody. Um, and that was one thing that I noticed with them. With Benedict was oh my goodness, this ain't Chinese Bears Benedict. <laughs> that was one of the right. first things that I noticed that I noticed about them. But then when we got into the ball game, for all the scoring that we had in the first half, it was penalty central in the second half, and then you had the controversial penalty at the end, which all would ultimately ended up costing that will award us the ball game. And like doc said, man, it was so hard to watch because of the penalties. Um, and this was something that was on ESPN too. So this is something that had the, that the SIAC has to um, address because it impacted um, your, the, the, the watchability of the game. And I'm not even sure that's, that's a, the game was not aesthetically pleasing because they're officiating. Uh, and, and, and let's just say that. Drew, uh, let's close it out as we're getting uh, a bit into it. Uh, my, my last comment is uh, this past weekend, we had a couple of uh, couple of big-name classics that we have uh, out there, Truth and Service Classic, the, uh, the, Chicago, the Chicago Football Classic. This week we've got the – Circle City class. But my comment is for these classics that do not have the network deal, the the NBC, the CNBC, the ESPN, the HBCU goals, please, please, I implore you, find a way to get your product back to the fan base, the alumni who cannot afford or do not have just the time to actually travel to your city to watch your classic. You know, there was the the greatest game no one ever saw yesterday was that Chicago football classic. Right. Morehouse came back, not only scored with three seconds left to go in the in the first half to regain the lead, but scored with ten seconds remaining in the ball game to win the ball game. No one saw that. No one. Same thing with the Howard and uh, the Howard Hampton game. Thanks to Dr. Cavill and Brian, we finally were able to track down.
now a link that I don't even know if it worked because I never had the opportunity to click on it to see if the game was uh if the game was live on that link. But we were finally able to track down the link as we were to have a conversation on Friday evening about about this game. Same thing with this Circle City Classic that's coming up this weekend. We had, if we want these type of classics to continue, we have got to find a way to get them to the people who don't have the ability to travel to these to these games. Southern Heritage finally decided to go to on on TV what two years ago. So we've got we've got to do better promoters. Stop being stop being worried about you losing money at the gate and see the bigger picture of the marketability, not only of your game, but of the whole city. Perfect way to end the show. Great segment, great thought process, and thank you for uh, sharing it, A.D. Drew. So important for us to understand that, particularly when you have more access and opportunities for games than ever uh, to have critical and key games uh, where you have avenues to uh, provide, if nothing else, solid streaming that people are credible about turning to the site. And I'll say that, frankly, that's my JBN, BCSN, or even a shout out to HBCU Game Day. You have these platforms, the HBCU Sports, that have the ability, one, to produce it and platforms to show it where a lot of people are already there. Take advantage of that opportunity uh, for these classics that are not doing it and do not have quote unquote these deals already in place with ESPN, uh Disney if you would, or uh HBCU Go, uh, or a number of other programs for that matter. With that being said, thank you for listening inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBCU Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington Charles Bishop. Want to shout out Brandon King in terms of joining us for the unveil of week number four poll rankings will be interesting as we get in week five you see these gentlemen giving you updates and give you some insights to make sure you're clear as you lather up and get ready for this week things are just getting interesting so stick uh with your hbc programs do not get too far on the ledge to give a shout out to uh charles make sure you're taking your data points to give a shout out to mike and all the other guys dave joshua in terms of doing the great work they do Look forward to checking them out tonight, along with Ryan, in terms of bringing it to you. I'll be a guest uh, on a show this evening. We'll tweet it out and give you some more updates in terms of what that. I'll be on Wayne Cartwright, giving him a little bit of love, of what that looks like. As we say, a do to BJ, uh, baby girl. Uh, let everybody know how we shut it down. Again, we want to thank you for listening, Dr. Bills, inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock, Sunday at 9. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I do it because I can. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Inside the HBC Sports Lab on YouTube. Uh, dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. A.D. Drew? Of course. B.J. Jones? Lecture. Dismissed.